So this morning we've been talking about technology trends, we've been talking about innovation, we've been talking about how we manage our companies moving into a world of rapid pace change. We're really lucky today to be talking with John Hankey. John, you graduated from the high school of business when? I think it's 20 years ago. I think it was 1995. You're making me feel very old. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> All right. So take us back to 1995. What were the trends? Why were you coming to school? What were you doing here? Because it must have been part of some trends in your personal life, but also some macro trends in society. Yeah, I was, it was a career transition for me. Uh, I grew up uh, in the, at the dawn of the personal computer era, uh, very passionate about programming, uh, back in the days of the Apple and Atari and TRS-80. Uh, but that didn't really seem like a legitimate career, you know, in 1985, 1989, whenever I came out of college. Uh, so I went to work for the government. I went to work for the State Department. Moved to Washington, D.C., got a real job, served overseas, uh, Southeast Asia, in Burma, came back to D.C., and, you know, having done, pursued a career that wasn't fully my passion for a few years, I wanted to try to get back to technology and sort of figured that, you know, moving to the West Coast, getting an MBA was a way to sort of get established out here and do that, and that's what I was trying to do. So were you a gamer back then? I liked games, yeah. I mean, like anybody who messes around with computers, I guess, you play games, and I, I loved programming games, and um, yeah, I thought that kind of entertainment was interesting, and I had this aspiration for starting a company kind of based around that when I came out to, uh, to business school. Did you ever think business school was a place to deploy an interest in gaming? I don't know. I thought it, it made sense to me. I mean, <laughs> I... I knew something about uh, you know computers and technology. I didn't know anything about business. You know, having you know worked in the in the government, so I just mm -hmm. sort of figured I needed to know a little bit about accounting and finance and marketing and some of that stuff. So to me, it was like establish your network on the West Coast and learn some basic skills and figure out how to how to do what you want to do. Well, how did that work out for you? Well, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> we. Um, you know, I was interested in that and, you know, kind of in doing a startup. It wasn't quite as common back then as it is, obviously it is now. Uh, but there were, you know, other classmates here that were interested in that. There was the, you know, Partners for Entrepreneurial Leadership, which was a student club that was about entrepreneurship. So I got connected with people who had that interest. One of my colleagues, Steve Sellers, uh, whom I know you know well, uh, was in the process of starting this company to do a new kind of game. Uh, you were asking about trends, so there was only one trend whenever we were going through, and that was the the internet, the Mosaic mm -hmm. web browser, and Netscape were in the process of uh, coming into existence when we were here. It was still dial-up modem days, but it was a very early stage of the internet, so we were all trying to figure out how that would be relevant to the things we were interested in. Mm -hmm. And several companies got started, you know, by by uh, colleagues during the time that we were at school. Yeah. So yeah, Steve and I started that company and we sold it on the day that we graduated. So there are some things back then that tie right to what you're doing now. Well, yeah, I mean, I took a hiatus from games for a long time, but yeah, with the latest stuff that I've been working on the past few years, uh, took the work that I've been doing in mapping and combined it with games, and now we're doing these real world uh, geo location oriented games, so yeah. So persistent time is still uh, yeah, I mean, we basically took that concept of, uh, you know, an MMO type game where you have millions of people all collectively participating in a massive game that goes on forever, and we took it out, you know, from the computer and basically just broke it out into the real world. And, yeah, so it's very similar to the stuff that we were doing way back then. So give us a little tour of the, we're very interested in this process of, of spinning in and spinning out, open innovation. You've been through that world intensely right now for the last 10 years. What's been your experience? How did you get into the geolocation stuff? Well, um, I sort of uh, fell into it. Uh, we started and sold that company. Then Steve and his brother and I started another company. That's where we actually ended up in the basement of the Bancroft Hotel, courtesy of the Haas School. Uh, we sold that company and then after that, I was kind of casting around for what to do next, and I met some engineers who uh, had been working on satellite imagery visualization at Silicon Graphics, 
legendary Silicon mm -hmm. Valley company, which mm -hmm. is, I, I guess, no longer with us, or barely so, if it is. Um, and it was Jim Clark's big win. It was. Jim Clark, sort of a big enabler of Netscape and a lot of other things. That yeah, when I was in business from. school, the Silicon Graphics was sort of the Google company. Right, it was the big time story. Um, but uh, in any case, yeah, they had been working on visualizing large amounts of satellite imagery data. So the company that came out of that was Keyhole. And we basically uh, set a very ambitious goal of creating this digital earth. Uh, it was crazily ambitious for a startup to try to do it, but we made a pretty good dent on it. And then after four years of building that, uh, we were acquired by Google and then given a lot more capital and resources to, to continue that vision, which grew into Google Earth and Maps and Street View. And so if we're going to look at business model trends over that time, when you were a standalone at Keyhole, what was your business model? Our business model was... Uh, about 15 years ahead of its time. It was software as a service. So um, we were one of the first people out there doing it. But we created this massive database of Earth information, uh, the imagery, map overlays, lots of different data sets. And we sold access to it on a monthly basis. Uh, and although we had originally started the company with the idea of it being a consumer company, where consumers would pay a little bit for uh, the right to use it, um, the dot-com kind of crash happened shortly after we founded the company, and we pivoted to be a B2B-focused company. So we were selling to engineering firms, uh, REITs, real estate, land development companies, uh, charging them you know, on the order of hundreds, thousand dollars a user per month uh, to access the system. But you know, that SaaS you know, cloud model is now you know, every app I use for the new business is like based on that you know, right. business model. We were looking at the disaggregation or the sassification of, of the world these days. And so you were right on it then. So what was Google's interest? Uh, well, I mean, Google's all about organizing the world's information and making it useful. And you, know, you have text, and you can search text. And you, do, you can do that great with the algorithms that uh, Larry and Sergey originally created. And that was kind of the original core competency of the company. But they were looking at all the other domains of data and ways to Organize data, search for data, make data useful to people. Uh, so they had started the book scanning project and maps and looking at things on top of a map and searching th for things on top of a map and all the data that is related to the earth and geography was this domain that they felt like Google ought to, would be important to them. They wanted to be good at. So mm -hmm. they bought us and poured a lot of capital into, into it. So here you were running your own Small company, if you will. How many employees before the acquisition? We were about 30 people. How many people were you managing um, a year after the acquisition? I don't know. A year after, it maybe was 75 people. Mm -hmm. Double in size? Two years after? I don't remember the in-betweens. I know when I left, it was between one and 2,000 people. Yeah. Wow. What was that like, that transition? Uh, well, you know, that was... Uh, Postdoc business education, I guess. That was <laughs> <laughs> sort of, uh, yeah, it was scale, scaling up. I mean, everything was growing like crazy at, at, you know, within Google at that time. Teams were growing. Our business was growing. Uh, we wanted to do things quickly. Uh, so it was you know, a tremendous amount of fun. It was very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. So the, the folks that spun in with you, if we want to call that acquisition a spin in, did it work out for them? Yeah, we had a great, we were always pointed to within Google as having one of the best retention rates of acquisition. So um, at one point, 75% of the people, and this was after some number of years, I don't know, five or six years in, we're still within Google and we're doing well. Uh, many have had you know, great careers within Google. Others you know, eventually left Google, like Noah, and started his own venture capital firm. And mm -hmm. were able to use that experience within Google to springboard you know, the rest of their career. So it worked out pretty well for it's Fantastic. For and of course, Google Earth and mapping in general is such a huge part of what Google is to the world. Uh, it's made a real contribution to their success. So why leave that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I came in as an entrepreneur. Um, I, had, I got to see what it was like to be a vice president in a large public company uh, with uh, a large staff, a lot of responsibilities. Uh, and um, you know, I decided that 
the idea of going out and making new products was more interesting to me, given a choice, than continuing to run a large organization, which has, as many of you know, are coming from big companies. Um, you know, a lot of that is administrative, uh, people management, which people management is fun to some degree, but you know, when you get into HR reviews and you know, a lot of it is just kind of helping people with their career, which I, you know is good, but it doesn't have a lot to do with the product innovation, which was the thing that originally interested me. So I was, yeah, I mean, I was at a point where you know I was lucky to be able to have a choice. Um, you know, I mean, it would have been a fine career to continue to do that, but mm -hmm. I, I did have a choice, and I and I, you know for um, personal interests as well as logistics. I was commuting from the East Bay down to Mountain View and I wanted to get out from under that commute, spend a little bit more time with my kids, um, created this new thing where I could do what I wanted to do and do it close to home and yeah. yeah. So what is this new thing? Uh, well, do, do you want me to use yeah, any of the prepared materials? Great. or okay. Sure, that Maybe. would be great. Why don't okay. you do that? Okay, all right, go through some slides. Uh, so, yeah, we started this group. We called it Niantic Labs. Um, this was after having run Geo in Google for about six years. We got to do some interesting stuff there. At one point, we uh, worked with GeoEye to launch this satellite, which was the highest resolution imaging satellite in the world at that time. Uh, we started Street View. We had hundreds of cars driving around the world, uh, as well as bicycles and handheld imaging devices. We actually built a digital map of the world. Uh, which employed multiple thousands of contractors offshore, utilized all the satellite imagery and Street View imagery to basically create a map uh, pretty much from scratch, which is now the foundation for a lot of things at Google, everything from ad targeting to the consumer mapping services that you use today. Um, one of the most gratifying, we did, gratifying things we did there was to support uh, disaster. So we would go in and image areas after there was, uh, the first one we did was the hurricane in New Orleans where we would go in and photograph everything after the flooding, get that online so that disaster response teams and people that were affected by that uh, would have a resource to build on. Uh, so one of the very last projects that I did before rolling off of GEO is we acquired this plane specifically for that disaster response mission. Most of our mapping um, aircraft fleet are actually turboprops, uh, but we bought this jet so that we could get there uh, quickly and image areas quickly uh, modified it, including cutting a giant hole in the fuselage to mount the special camera system that we utilize inside of Google. So that was the end of my geo career. Uh, went from commuting down to Silicon Valley to biking and taking a ferry into San Francisco, which was a great kind of personal uh, benefit of making this jump, um, and started Niantic Lab. So that Journey has just reached a point where we just spun that out of Google, which I guess we'll talk about and you know, some of the mechanics around that. Uh, we started that with the idea of investigating this idea of ubiquitous computing. It, computing interfaces to everything that you encounter in the physical world was kind of the concept. You know, we saw computing breaking out from the desktop. Smartphones uh, had obviously become pretty ubiquitous at that point, and we were looking at you know, what is the significance of that, what new opportunities are created by that. We named the group, it's kind of a weird name, Niantic. It's actually a town in Connecticut. Um, it's a whaling town. They used to build ships. One of those ships was sailed to San Francisco during the gold rush. Uh, the story is that during the gold rush, everybody was coming to San Francisco. Nobody wanted to leave San Francisco because everybody wanted to get rich mining gold. So these ships piled up in the harbor. They didn't have any wood to build hotels or stores or anything else with. So they actually dragged these ships on, store, on shore and used them for buildings, and the Niantic was one of those ships. It was a hotel, a bar, a brothel, and these ships ultimately got buried in downtown San Francisco by the sediments, and the skyscrapers were built on top of them. So the Niantic is actually buried about a block from the Transamerica building. It was an interesting story, but the idea was that there's this hidden information out in the world, and electronic devices, ubiquitous computing, augmented reality, those kinds of technologies could help you learn about these things as you're out moving around in the physical world. Uh, trends, so the trends that were um, happening at the time that we started Niantic, uh, wearable computing was really just kind of coming um, onto the scene. So we were thinking about what's the post cell phone world gonna look like? What kinds of devices are people gonna use? What kinds of services would be enabled by these new kinds of hardware? We were also interested in being an advertising company in if you have you know, mobile computing and services that people are using while they're moving around in the world, being a mapping person, the question that we asked ourselves uh, was, could these services influence how people behave in the physical world? 
So could the products that they're using cause them to walk a different path, drive a different path, divert from the trajectory that they're normally going to go on? If you could do that through information services that you're offering to people, there's tremendous opportunity there for businesses that might want to uh, change the behavior of people to get them to go places they wouldn't otherwise go. That was kind of one of the basic concepts that we wanted to investigate. So we launched a product called Field Trip. It's about information discovery. Uh, we ultimately incorporated over 300 publishing partners into that. It basically, like the story about the Niantic ship, it surfaces information about the world as you're out moving around. So it could be history, it could be information about bars, shopping, that kind of stuff, art, architecture, basically just tells you about stuff that's around you. Um, some of the folks that uh, we signed on to basically funnel content into that. And, you know, we were predicting the future. We were looking at trends. Google Glass was coming. We're so stoked about Google Glass. We launched on Google Glass. And we all, you know, know how that went. Um, so you can't always predict these things. I guess, you know, maybe that's the trend lesson. You know, the fundamental trend may be valid, but, you know, there are going to be fits and starts along the way. And, you know, maybe that was one of them. The second uh, product that we focused on was going back to my gaming roots, but combining this idea of location and influencing you know, where people go. Um, I have young kids, they were into computer games, and one of the things that I was struggling with was screen time. And yeah, you love computer games, but can you get your kids to go outside and play? And why can't you? Why can't you build a gaming experience that takes place outside, that uses mobile phones or mobile technology? So we put our heads together, uh, we worked on prototypes, I hired some people from Sony, uh, Disney, uh, Electronic Arts, uh, and we started thinking about, can we build a game that takes place in the real world? And we actually built paper prototypes, uh, tried various combinations of rules and explored ideas. Um, that ult ultimately turned into this game called Ingress, uh, which I don't know if you've tried it. I hope you will. It's fun to play. A bunch of people play it right here on the UC Berkeley campus, along with uh, 13 million people all around the world who play this game. It's all one giant game where two factions are basically competing with each other to uh, control the world. Uh, you can play it by yourself. You can just kind of walk through campus. You can hack some portals, which will be kind of interesting statues or historic buildings around campus. It can be a very solo kind of thing, which is just take a walk. It's a little bit of a kind of gamified distraction. But whenever you get involved in the team aspect of the game, it feels a lot more like if any of you ever played Risk as, a, you know, with your kids, or when you were a kid, where you've got a bunch of people around the table and you're all strategizing about how to, you know, take over North America or like break into Australia or whatever, there's this collaboration and strategy planning that ended up being the core of the game. So this whole social network grew up around ingress that we didn't expect. Um, there was a data aspect to it as well, where people were identifying the places in their cities and communities around the world that were kind of the nodes on the game board that people would be fighting over. We told them to find historical spots interesting local businesses, basically cool places in the community that would be fun for people to discover while they're playing the game. And people have done that. We have millions of these locations that have been submitted by users and now part of this global game board. Um, so that was the hypothesis. We put the game out in the market. And somewhat to our surprise, I guess, it worked. It worked better than we initially anticipated. And people have done crazy things motivated by just the pixels on the screen, this little game. Uh, people have chartered helicopters to go off and capture portals, uh, flown airplanes to remote corners of the globe. Uh, people, you know, play while they're pushing their baby through the park. Uh, there are people that have disabled folks who have made custom wheelchairs and who go out and play the game. So it's really been great to see people get up and be physically active, motivated by a video game. Um, we've been successful in reaching families playing together, couples playing together, uh, really kind of a wholesome fun take on what a video game can be. Um, people meet through the game. So in the MMO game that I was referring to, like World of Warcraft, you know, people meet, but it's like your avatar meets somebody else's avatar, and you don't really know what that person is or anything about them, really. And those, those are kind of fake relationships. But in Ingress, it took that dynamic and put it into the real world. So people are meeting, but you're meeting the real person, and you're forming a real friendship. And we've had many uh, dating relationships that have emerged from this, several marriages at this point that have come from people who've met through the game. Um, this is the game board and the client where the guy made the sort of diamond ring by connecting portals together. That was his way of proposing to his wife. Um, and now we've actually had the first 
uh, crop of uh, babies from the couples that have met through the game. Uh, one of them named their baby after one of the fictional characters in the game, which was kind of frightening. <laughs> uh, senior citizens play the game. This one was 82 years old when I met her. She's now walked over 1,000 kilometers playing the game. She had a hip problem and she had diabetes. They were both troubling her when she started playing. Her kids introduced her to it. Her diabetes is under control. And she's met all these young people. So she's like grandma. She's actually called Agent Nana. And she, um, she hangs out with all these hipsters up in Seattle playing Ingress. So it's pretty cool. Um, people get out. They walk. They lose weight. We didn't really think about it as a fitness product, but it has that aspect that's very attractive to a lot of people. People climbing mountains. Uh, people renting, chartering airplanes to fly to remote airports in Alaska during snowstorms to capture portals on behalf of their team. Uh, people getting tattoos of the game logos. When we first started seeing these, kind of freaky. Uh, <laughs> I met uh, a woman who was playing the game, and she said, I've got something I want to show you. And I was like, OK. I'm <laughs> thinking of my wife and my kids. I'm like, I don't know where this is going. Uh, and she pulls back her wrist, and she shows me this ingress tattoo on her arm. The first time I saw that, it was quite shocking. But now there have been dozens of these. People really get into the game. It's a life-changing experience for a lot of people. They're getting outside and meeting people. A lot of people are stuck in their apartments and houses watching TV without any meaningful social connections to people around them. It is a real social problem. And we're kind of getting at that through gaming. Uh, so yeah, the game has kind of expanded. We do books, comic books. We do a bi-weekly YouTube show. Uh, the players started getting together, unplanned, unexpected by us. These meetups became the heart and soul of the game. They got bigger and bigger all around the world, literally on every continent. Uh, went from a few dozen people getting together to hundreds, a thousand, thousands. This is 3,000 plus people in Munich. Uh, then that went to 5,000 people in Tokyo. And then that went to 6,500 to 7,000 people in Kyoto. So it's a game. you can play it by yourself, but we have these big events, and it's kind of like Comic-Con meets a 5K. Because it's, you know, people are coming, you've got the gamer aspect to it, but it's about walking through the city. It's a little bit of a historical walking tour as well, because you're walking through interesting parts of the city. So these events have proven quite uh, popular, so we continue to host them all around the world. We're doing one uh, in New Orleans uh, in a couple of weeks, and there's sister events in, um, well, there's one in Okinawa, Japan, there's one in Taiwan, there's one in Hamburg, and there's one in Milan coming up. Uh, the game got really popular in Japan, kind of took off and, and became even more popular in Japan than in the US and in other countries. We won a bunch of awards over there. We just recently won, there's a thing called Tokyo Game Show, which is, if you know E3 in the US, Tokyo Game Show is a huge deal in Japan. We won the, the game designer uh, grand prize there. It's one of two grand prizes that's awarded by people in the gaming industry, actually. So definitely got noticed in Japan. Uh, so that kind of took us through the period of kind of growing this inside of Google. We reached the end of our kind of charter as a startup within Google, and we had to make a decision about, are we going to fold this into some other product area and try to make it fit into one of the organizational arms of the company, or do we spin it out? And um, I chose the latter. Uh, probably could have made it work either way, but spinning it out seemed like a, a more interesting path uh, for me as a, you know, a former entrepreneur, uh, that seemed like fun. So yeah, we started the spin-out process earlier this year. Uh, it was supposed to take three months. Uh, it took seven months. Um, we basically looked at everything that we had learned over the three to three and a half years that we'd been doing this inside of Google and created a business plan around the stuff that worked uh, and discarded the stuff that didn't work. So s focused on this notion of immersive real-world gaming, that's what we're about creating these great outdoor play experiences powered by technology. Um, as it turns out, gaming's a huge market and a growing market, uh, 70, 80 billion dollars headed towards 100 billion dollars. It's also one where there's market disruption going on. The traditional gaming console, which used to sort of own everybody's living room, a lot of that money has now moved to mobile, like tens of billions of dollars. And that continues to flow from the traditional game industry to the mobile world. And then people are looking at, you know, even evolution beyond the mobile phone and tablet. You've got VR and AR kind of as the next major set of technologies that are coming. A lot of people are very excited about VR. You know, the Oculus, Facebook, $2 billion. Sony's got a version of that. For me, the future of VR is not as exciting. Um, I mean, I'm sure it will work for some people. I'm sure it will be popular with some people. But the idea of our 
kids and you know a large section of the population locked up inside of a room with a headset covering up the rest of the world, isolated and having this electronic experience. I don't know. I think that's kind of scary. So we're kind of the counterweight to that. We're saying, no, rip off the headset, don't stay inside, go outside and play. Uh, we think that's an even bigger market. Uh, other people agree with us. Uh, you know, people are trying to figure out which one's going to win. Trends, VR, He's AR, door, which is the real me. deal. Um, I think it's AR. Microsoft's made a huge bet on that. Uh, Google's made a huge bet on it in the form of Magic Leap, $500 million investment. So we're the software for that future. And that's, that's the investment thesis for the company. Uh, through the success of Ingress and our popularity in Japan, we came into contact with uh, the Pokemon company. If any of you are familiar with Pokemon? If you, any of you have kids, I know you're familiar with Pokemon. <laughs> um, Mr. Ishihara is the CEO of that company. Uh, very interesting company. They license the Pokemon IP to all things, uh, trading cards, stuffed animals, video games. And Mr. Ishihara is a big gamer. He started out in the game making uh, industry. He became a fan of Ingress. Uh, they were the first company we thought of when we thought about, well, what comes after that? How do you take this geeky, somewhat niche experience and take it out to a bigger audience? We thought, what games would be a close fit? If you know anything about Pokemon, it's about these kids who go out into the forest and they capture wild Pokemon who are out roaming through the world. So, wow, we could do that with our game platform. So we pitched that idea to them. Uh, they were very excited about it, and it started this uh, dialogue that... Uh, just recently kind of culminated in the announcement of the Pokemon Go project, where we're taking the Ingress gaming platform, building a Pokemon game on top of it. We announced it in September. We plan to launch it next year. Uh, Nintendo is helping us. They're actually building a hardware device. So going back to trends, remember the initial slide I showed you about our interest in wearables? There was a, there was a Fitbit device on there. There was an up band. Uh, now we have Nintendo making a custom wearable device that you use with your phone play the game. So you can use it to play so you don't have to go around looking at your cell phone while you play the game or a parent can give it to a kid. So you've got your running errands like me on the weekend, your kids are in the back seat, they're kind of restless or whatever. They can have the Pokemon Go device. When, you're, when you pass through a Pokemon, if you're a shopping mall or wherever, the device starts vibrating, it starts flashing and the, and your, the kid can capture the Pokemon by pressing the button in a certain, certain sequence. Then you can open that up on a tablet or smartphone later and you can see the Pokemon that you captured. You can fight the Pokemon, you can control territory, there's depth to the gameplay, but the basic idea is going out in the real world, going for a walk in the park or the zoo or wherever, and capturing these digital Pokemon. Uh, and uh, that's uh, at the announcement. It was, that was huge fun for me as a lifelong gamer, gamer because I got to announce it with uh, Mr. Ishihara, um, who is, you know, the CEO of Pokemon, uh, this is uh, Mr. Masuda on uh, the right over here. He was one of the original programmers on Pokemon, has been working on the game for over 20 years, so he's a real gaming legend um, in Japan. And on the left side of the screen uh, is uh, Mr. Miyamoto, who uh, is probably one of the most famous game creators in the world. He uh, designed Mario and Zelda and all those like super famous, super popular uh, Nintendo games. Uh, so he's been a big supporter of the project as well. So yeah, spin out's done, seven months of my life, finally October 19th, basically that was announced to the world. Um, and teeing it up for discussion, there are kind of a couple of things here, you know, what was it like trying to do a startup inside of a company, this idea of intrapreneurship? Uh, you know, lots of advantages to that. Inside of Google, we had all this infrastructure, offices around the world, great talent, so we could assemble the team very easily. Real estate, IT, legal, accounting, all those functions were available to us. We didn't have to go out and try to create those ourselves, so we could focus on just the product. Um, obviously, being part of a parent company like Google is a tremendous advantage when you're trying to introduce a new product. Um, and there were synergies with other parts of Google. You know, there were other teams that we could leverage what they were doing. Um, you know, on the other hand, there were a number of cons, oh, you know, over a longer term. The parent company brand and the parent company strategy ended up being a real challenge because we didn't always fit with how Google wanted to define its brand. And uh, it became 
you know, difficult for us. You know, do we want to make a PR announcement in a certain way? Do we want to position our group within Google in a certain way? It doesn't fit Google's overarching kind of brand strategy for that quarter and the, you know, how the, what the PR team wants to emphasize for the overall company, then it's a little bit of a mismatch. So that ended up being, you know, a struggle over time. Also, as a large and very successful company, uh, you can imagine the Google has a tremendous amount of legal uh, frameworks and, in fact, regulatory uh, compliance that it has to do. It, you know, there are a number of consent decrees at this point in terms of um, how we have to do things in different countries around the world. It's a very complicated landscape to launch an innovative new product in. A lot of concern about privacy in Google just because of the breadth of the company and everything that it does. We're doing a game that involves location and people out moving around in the world. That location is reported back to a server. How do we handle that information? What kind of disclosures do we make? That's a tough thing to tackle on your own, but to add on the layer of scrutiny that Google gets on top of that made it even more challenging. And then there's a whole bunch of internal processes inside of Google at this point to make sure that teams comply with all of the policies of the company so we don't get the company in trouble. But that ended up being a little bit cumbersome for us, trying to move quickly like a startup and you know, to have to go through all the review processes that uh, are necessary to keep Google out of trouble. Um, and uh, yeah, this idea of you know, independence versus integration into the rest of the company. We found that over time, our interests and our focus were you know, diverging from the interests of the core part of the company. So the synergies weren't as great as maybe we initially anticipated. Um, and it ad added to the luster of doing the spin out. Um, the things that I've been wrestling with for the past seven months, um, IP ownership, you know, you develop IP within a large company, what gets transitioned out? What licenses back are made to the company? What rights does the company have? How does that trade off against investor interests? Very complicated thing to unravel, even though we had sort of anticipated we might spin it out someday when we push came to shove and you start writing up those agreements, it gets very complicated very quickly. The team, people are leaving Google. How does Google feel about that? How do the individuals feel about that? What if not everybody wants to go? What if your critical people don't want to go? How many people are necessary to make the spin out viable? And you know, how do you get that kind of core team together? Uh, very interesting process. I ended up uh, spinning out of the company with some incredibly talented folks. Some people that I really wanted to be part of the team chose to stay in Google. Why not? Great company to work for, tremendous compensation. That was a real struggle to kind of get through. The whole idea of ownership, what does the parent company own? How do you incentivize the team? How much does the team own? How do you get enough equity to new investors to incentivize them? That's, there's one pie, you gotta slice it up. Uh, very interesting slicing there. Uh, I had to go out and solicit investors, so I went out and pitched normal VCs. Nintendo ended up being our, Nintendo and the Pokemon company ended up being our lead investor. We pitched strategics as well. We ended up with uh, a lot of interest in VCs, but a little bit of a mismatch in terms of uh, where we were coming out valuation-wise and where the VCs uh, were kind of used to investing in startups at, and the corporate ended up being the better choice for us. Um, but, you know, long and interesting process to go out and pitch a, a spin out to venture investors, and what does that mean? What are they getting for their money? How do you value it? Um, I learned a lot about that process through that. And then the whole post-spin governance, who runs the company, what control, if any, does a parent company have, in addition to the normal kind of governance issue that you have between the investors and management. So those are all things that we worked through, I think, successfully at this point, and we're, we're off and running.